Okay, I'm afraid that Stephanie challenged me with an impossible task to synthesize something that makes sense from all these things, even though we're all dealing with audiovisual materials coming from so such a diverse background with such diverse ideas about it. But I'll try my best. And I was told I should open the floor also to the public at some point. So we will do that in perhaps like 20 minutes after we've done our first round here. So uh, be prepared to intervene when you want to. And I suppose there's going to be microphones going around. Um, my first question to all of you would be to comment on something that Rick and I discussed in the lunch break briefly. Um, the situation today is that the analog archivist, if you will, is challenged by everybody in this room and by everybody on this planet, as it seems, or held responsible for the digital representation of, its, of his analog objects. And if there is one, you have to deal with it somehow. You have to make it accessible. You have to turn it into a business. You have to monetize it and all that. And if there is no digital object of your analog object, then you're bad. That's the situation today. The situation of the future might be that the digital archivist is the one who is held responsible for the analog object. And what does that mean? We'll start on that side. OK, thank you. Um, I do uh, agree uh, with the last speaker also that there's a, a huge responsibility, uh, responsibility for the uh, government to still invest in the analog material, to digitize it. Um, I think there's huge responsibility over there. Um, and I do think the, well, the, a lot of the digital archives are not, um, they're held responsible. But I don't think that's really fair to the analog uh, uh, archives. So I think I must agree with Claudia that there's, a, what, like I said, there's a huge responsibility there for to keep our cultural heritage in that sense. So I, um, I think we all share that sense of responsibility. Um, but to say that digital archivists will be held responsible for the analog um, collections or heritage that that's still in the in the archives possibly but I doubt there will be much work done on that analog collection I think I mean we've I think once collections have been digitized and they um, prove to be sufficient for access purposes that as defined by the Institute or by the users actually if that's enough then analog um, uh, carriers um, will be involved um, in the well uh, in the right conditions, hopefully, um, and probably won't be touched. Like next next year, we, we're reorganizing on the first of um, January, where we are switching basically to digital archivists. Um, we've only got um, from the current 50 people that work with analog film this year. Next year there will be four. So that's, that's a big shift. Um, that, of course, has also to do with the fact that we are stopping. We, we, we're not digitizing anymore because we, the, the program has ended. Um, and yes, we still, we st as, a, as, an, as, a, as, an, as an as an institute, we still feel responsible for the analog collections. But we will not. They will, they will just be in the vaults. And that's it. Yes, I, of course, agree with. Uh, what was said, um, what you probably need uh, is uh, good programs on universities, training for, um, well, digital archive, archivists. Um, and, uh, well, it has not yet started. Yeah, I, when, when I go to the universities and I talk to, talk to people or do lectures, I see that there is not enough uh, done, ha has not been done enough, uh, and we have to do more here in the universities mm -hmm. and the training for, for uh, well, knowing what is needed for a digital um, archives. And uh, yeah, that's the big challenge. Um, 
there's a great danger that agreement is just going to break out violently on this panel, so I'll try to stir it up a little bit. Um, perhaps what is actually happening is that we're reaching the point where so much material is now born digital that you know, there never was an analog equivalent of most television that's being made these days or many films that are being shot digitally um, unless you want to preserve the hard drives as historical artifacts. And, you know, maybe at some point we will certainly keep a sample of them. Um, so what's happening is that within the audiovisual sphere, we're um, having the same issues that librarians of printed books and maps and manuscripts have had and been facing for many years. You know, the fact is that manuscript degrades every time someone touches it, so you need to preserve it as carefully as possible and limit access to it only to those occasions on which it is absolutely necessary. And if you can have a, you know, an adequate digital copy equivalent, then you use that. What gets interesting is when we reach the point where the digital copies are actually better than going back to the analogue, where the things you can do with the digital copy completely replace and indeed offer improved access to the material. And then you ask the question, yeah, are we keeping these analogue copies solely because they are museum artefacts rather than objects of study in the way that they have been in the past? And at that point, is it worth keeping them? No. I would like to keep them, but that's because I'm nostalgic. There may not actually be a good economic or cultural reason to keep them, except a few samples in display cases. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is not my opinion. <laughs> so, for example, I think, uh, of course, they are um, the artifacts. We happen to discuss the question whether they have a status as originals. No, but nevertheless, they are, in a way, the originals and, as such, for example, museum objects. So never, one, you would never destroy a, a map of the 15th century because it's just uh, digitized. I think it, um, analog material is uh, still valuable for t at least two or more reasons. One is to experience, let's say, a kind of or or original um, per perception when you see uh, an analog copy. The other one is that we are quite sure that um, analog la will last a, a lot time more than the digital. So you have to, you to have your migration processes in a constant and permanent way. I don't know whether we will be able to do so. Um, nevertheless, um, there are many, many aspects uh, to keep the uh, original um, formats and the analog material. Um, so I think uh, if we talk about responsibility for the cultural heritage, we've moved from a widespread moral panic that digital will disappear before our eyes to a kind of acceptance that somehow we're going to figure out the problem of digital longevity, just like we're going to figure out climate change. Um, digital materials are very complicated to keep. They require uh, a society that is able to continue to generate electrical power. Um, they, they require the ability to constantly refresh and, ref, um, you know, and uh, migrate, all these things. I don't really have a position on that. I would just like to say that it, as far as I'm concerned, the analog backlog is increasing. Um, there are many places in the world where there is more and more analog material that will never easily be digitized, uh, there, were, there won't be funds to digitize it. And the big cultural heritage question of the 21st century is going to be, do physical objects have the right to exist? I think that's a very interesting question. Do physical objects have the right to exist? Maybe we can have four or five more conferences. <laughs> Okay, assuming this digital realm and a source of electricity can be maintained, is it then possible to envisage in this digital realm a cultural sphere beyond the business models that asks for remuneration? I think most of the people on this panel would wish for that, 
but we face the question from everybody around us that we should give them a reason for digitization and the reason that is insinuated in the question that is given, well, can you digitize and how much do you want to digitize and when do you want to digitize and what do you want to digitize? The insinuation is always, will it be bring in something other than a value that we might share and we're here in the museum I always wonder, would they ever ask anything like that to the curators of this museum? If we acquire this work of art, will, what is the interest rate on the keeping of it that will make us all happy within the next 10 years? Is this question ever asked? Why is there a question asked to us like that? Uh, can I? I think it's the nature of audiovisual heritage. For some reason, it seems that, that, that there is an idea that there is much more of a business model, that money can be made with audiovisual material. For example, you're right to say that um, in the Netherlands, it's the same discussion. Audiovisual archives are facing difficulty to get funded for mere preservation, for just preservation. Whereas the Rijksmuseum, um, museums that have paintings, objects, they there are entire vaults being built for them, uh, restoration units, and no one's asking them to put the material on their walls even. You know, it can, it can be locked in those vaults, they're spending millions on it, but as soon as it's audiovisual material, hey, there needs to be access. I mean, I'm very much in, I'm very much in favor of access, but it's very peculiar that with audiovisual there seems to be an extra, an, an extra sort of pressure on audiovisual archives to provide that access and to have those business models, whereas other museums or cultural in institutions don't get pressured like that. It is one of the reasons that, that when it comes to audiovisual archives, they're seen as sitting to one side of the major movie and television industries. So, yeah, the, the fact is, a friend of mine said many years ago, the academic discipline of computer science only exists because the computing industry exists. Were it not for that industry, you would not have computer science in universities. Is it that because television producers, film producers, want their work to be seen as having enormous commercial value, it is impossible to look at cultural heritage outside of that pers perspective, that framework, and therefore, even though we might, in this room, make a different argument, politicians, funders, philanthropists, whatever, are always going to see it in that way. And so we, we have to actually almost associate audiovisual material more closely with the oil paintings and get it away from the movie industry rather than try to counter the pressure that is put on by the movie industry to assign commercial value to what is being held and curated. The original sin of most moving image archives was to collect uh, narrative entertainment films produced by the industry because it completely biased the idea of what our business was. Um, and this business model, I mean, I think everybody knows that, except maybe a few bureaucrats, that the business case for digitization of cultural heritage is very, very weak. Value is rooted uh, in, in, in many other different considerations. Really, the only kinds of moving images that can ever make money are sports, entertainment, a little bit of news, and erotica. And erotica doesn't even make money anymore because the internet killed sex. So I think somehow we, as, as archivists, we need to push the case that the kinds of, of records that we want to emphasize are the kinds of records that relate to the daily life and work and experience of, of people. I, I heard this in, in really so many of, 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 of what, so much of what everybody has said. Um, and we need to do our bit to, uh, in a sense, to strip these documents of commercial value and begin to develop a more um, populist and democratic sense of what value really means. Otherwise, um, we'll always just be poor relations. I, can I very quickly say, I've said uh, several times you know, to, to colleagues at the BBC, they don't believe me, um, that, that if you have a piece of film that is, and, you know, say, the only ex existing film of a building that has since been demolished, the fact that some highly paid actor is emoting in front of the building should not stop you being able to use it for appropriate research purposes. 
Okay. Um, another question would be the technical challenges. Is it possible to digitize everything? Do we need to digitize everything and how do we do it? Um, Tom suggested that they made just like fixed format decisions based on certain considerations and they made tiers and all that and you are now stuck in this digitization for the foreseeable future until you, new needs will come up and then you may have to reconsider to go back to your analog originals with the four people that can handle them. Um, Rick brought up the, the thing that he's already re-digitizing material that was digitized before and now you have new ideas about it and you go back to it. How do we deal with these technical challenges that come obviously at us in greater speed all the time, format changes, resolution changes, more demand for high definition and so forth? I think a very important step is to document um, knowledge. It comes in, it sort of comes in waves. Um, currently, we have a really big need to provide access to what we've all digitized. I mean, basically, the Dutch taxpayers have invested in Dutch audiovisual heritage in the last seven years, so we've been able to digitize it. And now we need to actually capitalize on that, make sure that we provide access. Those four people, that may sound really crude, and I actually wanted to point it out because it, it, it sort of it makes it very tangible uh, that, that there is this conflict that we're in between. We're documenting more than we've ever done. We, are, we, we, have, we have very st good contracts with suppliers to maintain hardware, to maintain um, material stuff where we can actually play and keep on digitizing this. We are digitizing still with those four people. There will be just continuing, but at a much lower pace. They will be digitizing whatever comes in or whatever comes in. So I don't think it's, a, it's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think there's a technical challenge. It just comes in waves, and, and I think with reduced funds, you just have to make choices. And you can always scale uh, when, whenever there's a need. And one of the things is, in fact, I was very impressed by the tools you were showing, uh, Margaret, in, about automatic extraction of metadata. We are getting better at figuring out what value there lies in the material and therefore being able to determine where we put our efforts in. So you would redigitize material which your processes showed had more value, I presume. Well, we work basically with uh, already digitized material, born digital material, so this is just another question. But um, it's, it's the same. As soon as it's digitized, we need uh, better access and uh, we have lots of technology there and uh, it's, it's just a question of um, yeah, making new services uh, and make them uh, available to the public. And this is something which works. Uh, it, it, we showed that it works. And um, it's, uh, well, we, we should go further here. Yeah, to what you said, to just connect all the knowledge which is out there. This is going to be very important in the future. The distance between the distance or the gap between what's digitized and what is not, between what is accessible and what is not accessible. Um, you know, in a sense, this is equivalent in a way to the gap between what we know and we don't know, or what we know and we can't know. And this ultimately isn't such a bad thing because the work of historians and the work of scholars and the work of even individuals trying to figure things out for themselves is about dealing with unknowns, dealing with gaps. I would never argue for the conscious destruction of cultural heritage. That's an act of war. That's an act of violence and aggression. On the other hand, loss isn't always a bad thing. Loss is formative. Many of the new histories of the last 50 years were triggered by loss. In the United States, the interest in African-American history, women's history, the history of working people was triggered by a sense that the documents were missing, the documents were gone. And so this tension you know, between accessible and inaccessible gives birth to, to history being made. So interesting contradiction. OK, yes? That's, that's what I just wanted to do. I just wanted to open this up to interventions from the audience. So if you have questions to the, the speakers, there's one. 
Yes, um, we often heard uh, today uh, that metadata and keywords and tagging is the key uh, to access and um, otherwise we know that YouTubers or uh, anyone who is giving more content into the web will not be used to tag and give keywords a lot. So is a, the question is, might it be a cultural technique for the future like reading, writing and coding uh, to teach tagging or keywording uh, the content which the public is giving to uh, the net or even to uh, institutions? Or otherwise, is it a field of service for institutions and organizations like uh, you uh, all represent uh, that it's a paid service, okay, there's my content, I don't have time to tag and keyword it, uh, do it for me, I, I will pay for it. Or is it a cultural technique we have to teach in the future, or maybe in the present? Yeah. Well, if YouTube shuts down and is petrified and archived somewhere, we might be tagging it for the next 300 years. You have an answer to that? Um, I think we are constantly learning ourselves when it comes to, of course, we do have our meta data, schemata, and structure, but how useful is it, and when will you have to change it, and where do you have to change it, and so it's not, um, let's say we do have our standards, but um, it's uh, in a way to be in, envisaged that, that we also have to learn. And I have no idea whether it's a new business model to, to, to uh, build up a kind of service for the, for the metadata uh, production or enrichment. Normally it's the other way around, uh, as we heard today, that you think or in a way expect that your users are um, uh, and doing a kind of enrichment work for your metadata by commenting them or giving new information. And uh, for example, that's an experience uh, by us as well. We have just um, published the, the digitized war, war uh, films from uh, World War I, and there is a lot of comment uh, by the users to say, this is that city, and, and the, the guy in front uh, of, of the camera is this and that guy. So, but perhaps why not, why not thinking about bringing both uh, spheres together? I, I, have a, I have a dream, I have a, I have a vision that, that one of the reasons why people don't tag is because they don't see the benefit of tagging. It doesn't reward them enough, frankly. Uh, and that's because Google and the other keyword-based keyword search engines have debased the currency of metadata. They do a very, very bad job and we have been taught to believe it is a good job. So let's suppose that at some point the linked data cloud coalesces, compresses and becomes a star shining brightly and suddenly every asset that's online that is properly tagged surfaces and becomes truly valuable. Let's be optimistic and believe that those of us who do tag our materials will be rewarded for this at the point where the web becomes properly the semantic web and we can dispense with Google. That's me being optimistic. Yeah, one more question there. Would you like a microphone to shout at me? <laughs> no, I don't completely disagree. Of course, metadata are very important, but uh, we're still doing this for 10 years, and uh, still the technology, the tooling is lacking, and that's something Google has got right. And I think that's a problem. We're still discussing concepts, and there's not enough uh, money and manpower uh, directed into the doing and to the representations. We have these great metadata formats, a lot of effort has went into that, but the representations and the interfaces are still quite poor, and I think that's ultimately the point where it, uh, the success will decide itself. I, I think you're absolutely right, the tools need to improve. I, I'm um, involved in an organization in the UK called the Copyright Hub, uh, which is attempting to simplify access to licensed material. And one of the things we did at the very start was um, some research into image metadata. And we're trying to put pressure on the, the manufacturers of image processing programs 
to improve the interface for tagging images, in particular to store rights metadata, but obviously to store everything else as well. So I don't disagree with you. I just hope that at some point the switch will flip and it will become so rewarding to tag your stuff properly, we will all do it automatically in the way that we have our cars serviced or, or um, our houses cleaned. <laughs> can, I, can I comment on that as well? Um, Mar unless Martin, that's me. The, um, the, 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 there's a lot of ways you could actually, I think as archives as cultural institutes, we should actually reach out more to the people that produce materials, because that's where a lot of the benefits can actually be made. That's something that the BBC has understood, of course, a long time ago, introducing the media management program in, within, within the BBC. We followed their example um, at Sun and Vision. It's a bit more problematic because we're not part of the broadcasters. But that is helping a lot. Um, you can also do tagging games. We're implementing our um, thesaurus um, in every single CMS from uh, TV producers, independent producers, documentary makers. And while they're typing, uh, short, well, while they're describing their shots, um, there's a little thing that pops up, and that's basically a thesaurus term. And they go, like, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, that's what I meant. And they're just tagging for us. For them, it's easy because they 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 get time because they don't really know what. How do you spell Gaddafi again? You know, it, what's the spelling? Well, oh yeah, it pops up. Well, that's it. And so that that that's what comes into our archive. So th th there's not really. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the automa the automated tools. There's still a lot that needs to be done. But there's so much information out there during the production process, but also in subtitles. Um, uh, for, for, for people who are deaf, for example, there's so much, you can extract so many terms out of that. And those technologies are actually quite well advanced. And that's basically what the efforts of the Cultural Institute should go to at the moment. Okay. There's, wait, wait a minute. Um, my name is Gunter Tau from the company TBS. I've, uh, there's one topic uh, I was a little bit missing in the, in the discussion here. That's, uh, Rick was mentioning that there is a huge gap, or as the Indian was saying, the big water between the US and Europe. And we are standing just in front of a new free trade uh, contract between the US and Europe. And nobody, well, a lot of people from the cultural view in Europe are starting to protest against certain things, because we are asking for transparency, and there is no transparency. We really don't know what happens behind the curtains behind the wall, because there is a petition to the European Law Court for three million people in Europe who are asking for transparency in the contract. And you know, when our European nomenclature will conclude the contract, you know, then there will be a big surprise in the cultural business regarding copyrights, rights, irrelevant. Yes. <laughs> I know, well, you are still on an island, you know, and the British, maybe they're thinking to go away from the European community, you know, but uh, nevertheless, that's the question. But, Please, you know, so you're don't associate me with them. <laughs> okay, Stefan has a question. Yeah, I have a actually very simple question, which uh, leads us back to your very first introductory question, Martin. Um, because I would like to know what is actually your access you have to your digital collection. Because we heard about terabytes, about parabytes, and I would like to know where actually do you store your digital collection? Because in the end, it is physical. It is on servers, it is on hard drives. Do you store it in-house? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, so some BBC stuff is moving into the cloud, but, but more, more for processing purposes rather than long-term storage. Um, personally, I don't think you can safely do archival storage in the cloud, because if you look at the business model of any cloud-based producer, if you are a reliable customer, then they will betray you when their business model starts to collapse. So you have to be very careful of them. Yeah, the same with us. We have only a small amount of uh, digitized material, but we keep it in our walls. I yeah. keep one same copy. And oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't sorry. Please go ahead. <laughs> same with us. We don't have a lot of uh, materials. Or just, I, don't, I think it's 43 terabytes or something like that, so we store it in-house. 
Of course, in 10 years' time, I'll keep our entire archive on something about this size in my pocket, so it'll be fine. I can't wait for the 100 terabyte drive. Um, I, store, I store one copy in a secure uh, space in Southern California and another copy in my house. <laughs> That's the safe copy. OK, can we have a third copy, please? The third copy I'll the take it. Internet Archive is holding. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, we should close it here because I'm getting frantic signs from the organizers because I think we have to have another break and then move somewhere, but you'll explain about it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Vielen Dank in die Runde.